Well, okay. Um, so what shall I say, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, whoever joined us today for this uh, third inaugural lecture that uh, Marco Toma Michel is going to um, give us, uh, he's going to talk about quantifying information from classical to quantum. And uh, Marco uh, is joining us as a principal investigator, needless to say, we are extremely delighted to have him with us. And, uh, but Marco is not uh, new to CQT. In fact, uh, after spending his uh, early days in his uh, research career in Switzerland, in ETH mostly, um, he then moved to um, CQT, in fact, and he worked uh, with uh, Stephanie Werner's group for a while before um, moving further south to Australia and then um, somehow bouncing back to the equator and he's with us. Um, Marco will tell us more about his uh, career path. Um, so Marco, it's, it's, it's really great to have you and, um, to, um, and, and we are all looking forward to, to your talk. Just for, as a, as a technicality, Yvonne reminded me, if you want to ask questions, do ask, send me, send me your question. Um, and uh, I will reserve, you know, the rights to moderate them a little bit. If you ask a too wacky question, uh, then I may just ignore it. Uh, it's not a censorship, really, uh, honestly. Uh, you can ask just about anything, but sometimes uh, the questions are either too complicated for a speaker to uh, address them in, in, a, in, in, a, in a finite amount of time, or just completely off the wall, in which case, uh, fine, just express your views, but uh, I, I will exercise uh, my freedom to ignore you. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the, remember that there are no uh, stupid questions, so don't hesitate, do ask questions, and uh, I'll um, convey them to Marco at the end of his talk, and uh, hopefully he will just uh, give us sort of uh, um, some of uh, his perspective and his answer on those questions. Anyway, Marco, the, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for the, the kind introduction, and it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, it's a great pleasure to be back in Singapore, even though uh, stuck at home. And I haven't been to CQT since, since I got here, but uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And, and uh, um, it's a yeah, pleasure to, to give this talk to, to all of you and introduce a little bit um, my research. So, so this talk, it, it's gonna have uh, three parts. So in the first part, I just want to give you some, some general information about my research and uh, uh, what I'm interested in. It's, it's going to be a very shallow, uh, broad overview. Um, in the second part, then I'm going to talk about this, this the, the, the title, um, which is kind of my, my passion a little bit in quantum information. Um, it's a passion that uh, runs very deep, but it's, it's not so easy to, to somehow uh, get across because it's quite technical and mathematical, but I'm, I'm going to try my best. And, and then at the very end, I'm going to go a bit more into uh, some particular result that, uh, that we had uh, a couple of years ago that I want to explain to you. Uh, there it might get a bit, uh, a bit technical, but I, I hope you will stick around uh, because at the very end, there's a, a hidden treasure uh, that you will see. So if you, if you stay until the very end. Um, okay, so let's then start with the, the first part. Yes, so a quick overview of, of the group. Well, first about uh, a bit about myself. So, so Arthur already mentioned, I started in ETH Zurich, actually in the engineering department. And then by accident, essentially, I ended up in uh, Renato Renner's group, which was maybe the best accident that could have happened. So he just started uh, a new group and, and I was looking for a PhD in, in theoretical physics and all the established people there thought, well, this engineer, we don't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, so they just put me to, to Renato and, and he, he was kind enough to, to give me a chance. So, so that, was, that was really nice. And then after my PhD, I was kind of uh, in this situation that, that I guess many people find themselves in that I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to continue in science. Um, uh, but I just wanted to try and see see how it goes for a bit, and maybe this was one reason that 
that brought me actually to Singapore, to be very honest with you. Um, at that time, the, the general advice from, from all my senior colleagues was to, to go to the US. You have to do your, PhD, uh, your postdoc in the US, and that gives you the best chance of, of finding a faculty position later on. Uh, but for me, it just, Singapore had much more, was just much more attractive to me um, as, a, as a location. And, uh, and again, this was, it's kind of, a, um, it, it was the best choice I, I could have made because I, I really enjoyed my time here and uh, had maybe the most productive time as well. Um, so, so that also kind of, um, well, uh, put the seeds for, for coming back uh, again now. So um, this was very nice. And in the meantime, I was in, in Australia. Um, first at the University of Sydney and then at the University of uh, Technology Sydney. So I kind of moved back into engineering and also now I'm um, at the Department of Electrical and, and Computer Engineering um, um, and obviously the PI at CQT. Okay, so that's that about uh, myself. Now, my research interests. Well, this is kind of a complicated uh, slide, um, but I just wanted to mention the three kind of core topics that that I'm interested in. So at the, at the, the foundation is this the mathematical foundations of quantum information, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. And, and this influences also the, the other two topics that I'm, I'm very interested in. One of them is, is uh, quantum cryptography or, or more generally security in a, in a quantum world. Um, and the other one is, is information processing and channel coding with, with finite resources. So I'll explain this uh, a little bit um, with examples later, but the, the main idea here is that, you know, all the kind of the tools that, that uh, I develop or help develop in, in the mathematical foundations, they then, then are used in, in these applications. Um, so they're not kind of, it, it's not a research that's purely out of, uh, uh, um, curiosity, but, but it, it also has some, some applications. Okay, so let me then just give a few, a, a couple of examples of, of things that I'm interested in. Um, um, one of them is, is channel coding. So here, this is really an example of this um, finite, um, finite resource problems. So when we, when we look at the channel coding problem, usually it's, it's considered in an asymptotic setting. Um, and classically, this is, this is often a, a good approximation, but when we look at quantum information, we have the issue that in this asymptotic setting, it's assumed that, that we have, um, for example, in this simplest uh, case here, which is the Holebo uh, capacity problem. So we try to send classical information over a classical quantum channel. So in this setting, we would need a quantum computer that, that can deal with n qubits and can do joint measurements on n qubits, where n goes to infinity in, in, in this limit, right? Um, but uh, qubits and, and large quantum computers will be expensive in the near future and, and probably for quite a bit. So what really uh, my interest here is to, to try to analyze these problems for uh, the case where we only have a finite, um, a, a, uh, a quantum computer can only deal with a finite number of, of qubits and see what are in, in those situations, what are um, the fundamental limits of how much information we can transmit through such a channel. And in this, this plot here, uh, you can see, you know, uh, for example, if, if the, we only have a 40 qubit uh, quantum device, then there is a trade off between the failure probability and, and the rate. So, so we cannot reach this blue line, which is the capacity, but we will stuck, be stuck somewhere below. And this, this is really fundamental and, and uh, kind of the analysis of, of these problems and many um, in, in similar, uh, of a similar kind is, is kind of one of, of my areas where I've been most active in and, and continue, will continue to be. Okay, so then um, the other one is, is also uh, a nice example of, of a similar thing. Um, so it's, it's really without going into, into res the resource series in particular, it's actually a quite a, a simple uh, problem. So we, we have um, two 
entangled pure states, psi one and psi two, um, and the target states that we want to, to create, uh, right? And we, we want to do this using uh, LOCC, so local operations and classical communication. And uh, one can then try to um, find optimal ways of doing this. I mean, it's a problem that can be, be solved uh, numerically. And it turns out that there's an, an interesting effect. So, so if we uh, take a share of, of Psi 1 and uh, some shares of Psi 2, so we, we can choose how much we take from, from each. Um, then depending on, on how, how we, we split this, um, we get a, a much smaller error. So there is a, a minimum of this error. And we call this a, a resonance. Um, and this kind of effect, we, we can observe it numerically, but our contribution uh, mostly was to, to find analytical predictions of, of this. So we can predict that this uh, minimum will be reached when this, this what we call an irreversibility parameter uh, goes to one. Um, so yeah, one, one thing I forgot to mention, so these states are all have the same um, uh, entropy, entanglement entropy. So they, they can be, asymptotically, they can be transformed into each other at uh, um, the ratio one to one. Um, so what we look at here is, is purely an effect of, of finite n. Uh, that's why we have an, an error. Okay, so that's <clears throat> another kind of um, topic that, that um, we were exploring and actually continue to explore because we, we are interested to see whether this, this um, resonance has applications in, in quantum thermodynamics. Okay, <clears throat> so the, the third one I, I want to point out is, is more in the, the area of cryptography. So I, I won't talk about quantum cryptography because Charles already gave you a very um, comprehensive overview of, of uh, research in, in that area. But uh, I'm still interested in, in cryptography, and this this particular thing is 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 um, um, I, I found quite interesting. So it, it's about um, blockchain and whether whether quantum computers can can attack uh, blockchain and what we can do about it. Um, and so so just to summarize what we what we found. So so uh, the blockchain itself is relatively secure. So one can uh, you know there's a, a hash function that one needs to invert to to try to tamper with a block. Um, and this can be done using Grover search, but the kind of speed up you get from that, the, the quadratic speed up, uh, is, is not really sufficient to, to break the whole thing. Uh, uh, um, however, the signatures, um, um, they are a, a bigger problem. So at some point, uh, you have to um, prove that you are the owner of some, some Bitcoins, for example, and you need to sign the transaction. And, and that part can be broken uh, relatively easily, well, relatively easily using Shor's algorithm uh, or a variant thereof. Uh, and that's kind of the, the one thing that people need to be careful about in, in blockchain. But um, well, thanks to our work and also other work, that there's now an awareness that uh, post-quantum cryptography is very relevant for, for blockchain. OK. So, so that's, as you can see, that's quite a broad spectrum of, of things uh, I'm interested in. Um, and the, my current group is in, in, in Sydney. So we have uh, three PhD students, Arinta together with Troy Lee, um, Maria uh, together with Chris Ferry, and also Akram with, with Chris Ferry. And they're working also on different topics, algorithms, quantum thermodynamics, quantum machine learning. And Alex is doing a master's on uh, uncertainty relations. So and that, uh, hopefully uh, when this uh, the the travel restrictions end um, later, hopefully later this year, then uh, two students and and two research fellows uh, starting here in Singapore. Okay, so that that uh, brings me to the second part um, of the talk, which is on uh, the topic that that was advertised. Um, What's, uh, what is information and what is quantum information? I'm not really um, looking at this on a, uh, philosophical, from a philosophical side. I'm, I'm really interested in quantifying information. Uh, so if, you, um, if you're interested in the more philosoph philosophical side, then I have a YouTube uh, video for you. Just let me know. Um, OK. And, and really, the first thing to do is, is to realize that 
actually quantifying information is 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 quite difficult uh, to to kind of put our intuition about information into mathematical formalism is 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 not so trivial. It turns out it's easier to quantify the lack of information or uncertainty. So that's the the approach um, we're we're going to take. Um, okay, so this this kind of the very basic setup of of uh, um, of um, what is randomness. So we 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 were thinking about uh, throwing a die, um, and uh, we can define uh, a sample space, so all the possible positions that die could land in, and and those are all have the the same probability, for example, and, and we can define what is a, a random experiment um, with this by by saying. Uh, by defining random variables that, for example, give us the number on top of the die or the, the number in, in the front face. Okay, so so that kind of is what we what we think of a, a, a random experiment. And the question is now, can we quantify somehow how uncertain we are about the outcomes or the outcome of such a random experiment? And one way to do it is, is in a kind of axiomatic way that we just impose some properties that this, this measure should satisfy. Um, so there are different ways of, of doing this. And in fact, already Shannon um, was thinking along those, those lines. Um, so one, one set of properties we can take is, is uh, the first, maybe the, maybe the most important is that it's monotone under mixing operations. So mixing operations here are operations that um, that um, can be thought of as just relabelings of the outcomes. So you just say a two is now one and vice versa, for example. Um, and, and then forgetting that we did the relabeling. So these are uh, mixing operations. In fact, all mixing operations can be seen in this way. So it's kind of about forgetting something, uh, some operation that we did on the, on the, on the random variable. And we say, okay, if we do this, then then our um, our um, measure of uncertainty needs to increase. It, it cannot uh, be reduced by such an operation. Uh, this, the second axiom is um, is additivity for independent events and, and subadditivity otherwise. So what we are saying here is essentially that if we have two random variables, for, for example, in this example here, the X and the Y, then their joint entropy has to be bounded by the sum of the, of the two. This essentially it has to do with, with the way uh, we want to measure uncertainty. We want it to be, um, we want to measure it in, in bits. So if, if, if we have, one bit of uncertainty in, in one random variable and one bit in the other, then uh, jointly there should be two bits. So this is kind of, because we are measuring in a logarithmic scale, um, um, that's what, what makes this, um, gives us this, this additivity constraint. And the subadditivity, um, you can think of as simply saying that, um, um, that it's always there is always more uncertainty on the individual um, um, uh, random variables than there is on, on both of them together, essentially because there there might be correlations between them that reduce the uncertainty. Um, so in this example here, one can compute it. For example, that that um, you see there there are, uh, six possibilities for x and y. They they're all equally likely. So in in total, there are thirty six different possibilities. Uh, whereas if you look at the joint random variable, actually there are only 24 different ways that the die can, can land, right? So if you know something about the top number, you know that you know the number at the bottom as well, because they, they always add up to seven. So, so that reduces the number of, of kind of uh, positions uh, uh, that the die can be in. Right. Or the, reduce the number of, of possible values for, for the other random variable. 
Okay, and the final um, axiom is, is, is continuity. Um, and this in, in some ways just for mathematical uh, convenience, you can think of it that way. But if you, if you impose those, then the only measure that, that um, really uh, works is um, the Shannon entropy, okay, which is defined in, in the way uh, most of you have hopefully seen. So, so um, this is our measure of, of uncertainty now. Um, there are other ways of, of getting there. So this axiomatic approach is, is just one. Um, maybe more natural is, is, a, is an operational approach where we, we just ask um, a, a particular question and, and look at what, what the answer is. So in this case, um, the question could be source compression. So, so we have a source of, of letters. The source could, for example, be if you, if you read a book uh, and you just look at it letter by letter. Okay, so you go through the book letter by letter. And uh, in this particular case, you also ignore all white spaces. So there are only 26 uh, letters. And then you ask, okay, can I compress this, um, this information that I read out in this way so that um, later on I can decompress it um, with an error that, that goes, well, okay, this is now information theory, the error goes to zero as the length of the book goes to infinity, okay? Um, so, and the question is, how much can I compress? And, and um, well, a first answer could be, we, we look at each uh, letter individually and, and, um, and try to compress this. So each um, symbol that we pick is, is considered as an independent um, random variable. And if, if we, uh, if we look at this problem, we find that the, the entropy of, of this X, which, which is computed from the, the frequencies you see here on the table, um, this entropy gives exactly the, the number of bits that we need per letter to store uh, uh, the contents of this book, okay? And in a way, this is better than, than uh, what we maybe naively could have expected because Naively, uh, we, we would need to, to take these 26 uh, letters and, and put them you know, in, in binary, so you just take the log of that. Um, um, so that, that way we can obviously store everything without error by just encoding the, the whole book. But in fact, we can do a little bit better by just taking advantage of the different frequencies. And the fact that the, that the entropy appears in, in, this, uh, in this problem, that's kind of, the operational justification of why, why this is the right measure. So as I said, we, we simply took advantage of, of, of the fact that certain letters are more likely than others in, in the English language in this case. This obviously, uh, these frequencies, they, they change a lot amongst uh, different languages. And in fact, one can study how well one can compress different languages and so on, uh, which is, is, is quite interesting. Um, but um, this is obviously not the best thing we can do because um, not only have letters different frequencies, but, but there is more information, uh, more correlation in, in these, uh, um, uh, it's not just a sequence of letters, right, the book. Um, so we know that certain, uh, after a Q, um, you almost always have a U, for example. So there, the, the uncertainty after we observed, uh, observed a Q for the next letter is, is very low. And this is the kind of um, effect we can take advantage of by looking at, at conditional entropy. So if we, if we look at the sequence of two letters, for example, um, we can see that their entropy is just the sum of entropy of one plus uh, the conditional entropy of the second given the first. Okay, this is just, this essentially defines what, what I mean by um, conditional entropy, so you can just plug it in from here. Um, and then the, the subadditivity tells us that this is always less than the sum of the two looked at individually. And we can kind of continue this, this game and then we, we find um, uh, for, for English text at least that if we really look at all these correlations among um, n different letters and, and let n be very large, then um, 
we only need around one bit per letter to um, to store or to, to compress this this text. So it's a huge difference, um, and this difference is due to um, correlations in in the uh, amongst the different letters and words and so on. So okay. Um, and, and this kind of brings us now to, to the information. So, so this concept of mutual information, it tells us exactly how much we gain uh, by looking at the correlation. So it can be seen as the difference between the uncertainty of, let's say, x2 and the uncertainty of x2 given x1. So it tells us how much we, we gain um, um, by, by looking at, at correlations. Okay, so now we have all these, uh, these concepts um, and it's, uh, um, I've now, I've just talked about them in, in one particular example, but, but one can uh, see for all of these, these quantities one can find their own, they have their own operational meaning in certain problems. So one one that's very relevant in in um, in cryptography is this is randomness extraction. So, imagine you have uh, some random experiment. You do some random experiment that gives you x, uh, but an eavesdropper has some uh, information about this x. So, for example, you you throw a die and and, and the eavesdropper knows the parity of of the uh, of the number you see on the top. Um, and the question is how much uh, randomness that is that is unknown to the eavesdropper that is uniform can you extract from such a such a random experiment and that's given by the conditional entropy again this is in, uh, only asymptotically um, but asymptotically one can one can find that this the conditional entropy tells you how much uniform randomness you can extract uh, from such a uh, random experiment. And uh, the other one is, is channel capacity. So here the, the mutual information plays a, a role. Um, so the capacity is given by the maximum of the mutual information between the channel in and output, um, maximized overall potential distributions over the input. So that's a, the famous formula for, for channel capacity by, by Shannon and that uh, gives an operation meaning to this mutual information. Okay, so, so these are kind of different concepts of, of measuring information. Um, and the good thing is that we don't need all of them. Uh, uh, we can kind of compress this all into one single quantity, which is called the, the relative entropy. So the relative entropy um, has, um, um, well, it can be seen as a kind of a, 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 an expectation value of, of this log likelihood ratio. Um, this is one way of looking at it. And, and if one looks at it this way, then also worth mentioning that sometimes, in particular when we look at the finite size uh, effects, we need more than just uh, this expectation value of the log likelihood ratio. We need the full spectrum um, of, this, of the distribution of, of this random variable. Um, but um, and, and that gives us, for example, Rennie entropies and so on. Um, but the idea essentially is that we have this single quantity um, and then we can express all the, the other quantities that we, we've seen in terms of this, this one single quantity, the, the, the relative entropy. And moreover, all the nice properties that these uh, quantities satisfy, uh, we talked about it only for the, the entropy, um, um, uh, the axioms there, they, they follow from, from two properties of the relative entropy. Uh, one of them being the additivity. So if you look at the product to product distributions, then, then uh, one can split this, the total uh, relative entropy into some of two parts. Um, and the other one is this monotonicity on the data processing, which um, tells us that if we apply any, any channel to both of the, the arguments here, then, then that will only, uh, cannot increase the, the relative entropy. 
So one way to think about relative entropy is just as a measure of distinguishability of the two distributions. So when you apply a channel, for example, then that, that makes them harder to distinguish. So you can't apply a noise channel on both um, or any uh, channel on, on, on the distributions that makes them easier to, to distinguish. That's, that's what this inequality um, tells us. So the reason I, 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 I introduced this, this relative entry is because um, this will now make it clear what kind of concept we need to generalize to the quantum setting. So if we can, if we can generalize this, this relative entropy to the quantum setting, then uh, then maybe maybe that's it then maybe uh, we're already done um, and we we have a way of measuring quantum information uh, instead of classical information um, so the first kind of question uh, we can ask on this is is quantum information just classical information that has not yet been measured okay I mean this in in the sense of um, of this formula here, um, where I define maybe a, a proposal for a for a quantum relative entropy, which is simply uh, so we have two states rho and sigma, and then I'm just looking at uh, the relative entropy I get after measuring rho and sigma, okay, and that it's maximized over all possible uh, measurements. That one could do. So P and Q are just the distributions one uh, gets from, from Born's rule. Right? So this is one way one could maybe define um, um, relative entropy for quantum states. And, and kind of the meaning of this would be well, you know, that there's not really much going on, um, except that we, we haven't really measured the, the Rowan sigma yet. So, so it's just a, a, the same thing, but um, um, we need to measure it. Um, and this strategy works, uh, works actually quite well for some quantities. So, so for example, the fidelity uh, can be seen in this form um, um, as an optimization over, over POEMs of, of the classical uh, distribution one, one gets. Okay, so this is this is one one way one could uh, maybe define um, uh, relative entropy. Another way is kind of the, the opposite. So so one could um, uh, look at uh, is maybe quantum information just classical information that's encoded in a quantum state, um, and and this can also be put into kind of a mathematical uh, definition. Uh, so this preparation uh, relative entropy, um, which you know here we minimize over all possible preparations, and the preparation is is uh, comprised of of the two distributions p and q, and a channel that takes p into rho and and q into sigma. Okay, again, and this kind of allows us to relate the quantum uh, quantity to to the classical one. And um, it's not too difficult to show that, that if, um, if we want our extension to be um, monotone on the data processing, so, so it, it should satisfy the same inequality that the relative entropy does, but now for quantum channels instead of classical channels. So if we, if we want it to have this property, then, then this, the quantity must lie between these two uh, uh, suggested um, generalizations. But we don't know if these inequalities are strict, right? Uh, so it could be that they're all the same. And in this case, quantum information really would not be any more interesting than, than classical information in, in a way. Um, but um, let's explore this. Let's, let's take a step back uh, first before we, we go back to this. And, and take the, oper the operational approach, right? Because we can, the same arguments that we had classically for, for what, what singled out the, the Shan entropy, one can again take an, an operational approach and ask similar questions 
to the to the ones we ask classically. So we can compress a quantum source. We can uh, extract um, um, randomness when when the the observer, the, the eavesdropper, has a quantum system instead of a classical system, and so on. And for all these problems, if we um, if you ask the same questions or the analog questions to the to the classical ones, um, we get the answer that the the quantities that that show up are, are related to this this quantum or umegaki relative entropy, and that is a particular way of defining um, now a relative entropy for quantum states. And again, um, um, here there is actually nothing special going on, so we can define then a mutual information and also a conditional entropy, uh, where this, this pi a would be the uniform uh, distribution. Okay, and, and this, um, this relative entropy, we, we can see quite easily that if the two states commute, then this is equivalent to the, the classical definition of relative entropy. So this is the one uh, quantity that, that has operational meaning in, in many uh, problems in, in quantum information theory. And that it was Hiai and Pet who, who first established this. And, and in, in, in that sense, they, they told us that this is the, the definition that we should use because it's, it's operational. Um, so it, uh, it's not only operational, but it also has very beautiful properties, in particular this, this data processing inequality that uh, I talked about before. So for any quantum channel, uh, when you apply the channel, it will at most, uh, it will not increase the, the relative entropy. And it can be formulated in terms of the strong subadditivity. These are equivalent. Uh, these are all equivalent statements. Um, so, so it's kind of the, the, the yeah, the question that uh, uh, I want to get back to is, is are these uh, three quantities that are now defined, are they maybe all the same or are they different? And it turns out that they're maximally different. So whenever rho and sigma do not commute, then, then really there is a gap uh, between, between these three quantities. Um, and so that's, that tells us in a way uh, that Quantum information is is is, is in the, yeah it's, it's more complex than than classical information because of this non commutativity and um, and we really have strictly these gaps. Uh, I should say though that that if you're just looking at at entropy as we started with, then um, it turns out that that one of these arguments, the sigma argument, is always a uniform distribution, and in that case, actually everything commutes. So so if you just look at entropy of uh, a single uh, quantum system, you can interpret it as just uh, uh, classical information or classical information that has been encoded into a quantum system. But as soon as you look at a conditional entropy or a mutual information, somewhere where you at least look at two different uh, parties, for example, in a communication setting, um, as soon as you do that, then, then things get interesting and, and you cannot just think of, uh, of quantum information that way. Okay, um, so just a very quick look at uh, how this, this comes about. I, I just want to mention here, you know, the, the way we prove it is by, um, and I, I should say that most of it has been known since the iPads, the, the, we made an extension to that this also holds if the measurement here is a P of M, which was a non-trivial step. But the way we did it was kind of interesting because we, we, we found uh, some variational characterizations of both quantities and, and see that they're related by a golden Thompson inequality. Um, um, and, and that kind of brings me to the, um, to the last part of uh, of this talk, um, because in the last part, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what happens if we have more than two non-commuting operators. And it turns out that then uh, things get get really quite messy. And uh, until recently, there was not really much known about this case. 
but but I want to tell you a little bit about some uh, progress we were able to make in on that front. So for that, um, and, and this progress is an extension of this golden Thompson inequality. So and this is kind of uh, something that people who start with quantum information uh, struggle with um, because there's so many things that that are trivial for commuting operators or for um, for scalars that just don't work anymore in in quantum information. And one of them is this this thing that you would like uh, if you see an exponent uh, with the sum of two things, you always wanted to write it as a product, right? Uh, this is one of the first things you 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 always want to do with with an exponent. Um, and for two matrices, this is only possible under the trace. Um, or in fact, and it, can, it can be a unitary invariant norm. So under these norms, one can do it, and then it's an inequality. So it's not an equality like it would be for, for commuting. And in fact, it's only equality if, if, uh, if they commute. OK, but at least we have this inequality here. Um, if, if there's three um, um, different operators, then we don't know anything uh, uh, at the outset. Uh, so we, these inequalities that we might hope for, uh, they don't they don't hold, and it's easy to find counterexamples. Um, so that's kind of the the starting point for uh, uh, for the last part of of the talk, um, and this is really um, about a, a technical result. And um, I will have to skip. Um, the proofs, um, for the most part. Um, uh, but uh, if you're if you're interested in this topic, then then maybe uh, come talk to me because this is really uh, uh, one of my, I guess maybe one of the, the results that I'm most uh, proud of was was this, this extension. Um, okay, so so what um, what is this? So so the let me maybe just present the result and then and discuss it a little bit um, and what this actually means. And, and in the end, I'll, I'll show uh, one interesting applications of it. And I'm hoping there are actually more applications out there that, that have not been found yet. Um, OK, so, so what's the idea? So we want to have an extension of this golden Thompson inequality. So we're looking at the sum of k different uh, permission operators here. And um, again, we want to bound them by, by the product. Okay, and it turns out we can do this, but we have to uh, somehow uh, shift this, these different um, operators by a little bit. And we have to do this on the imaginary axis. Um, so, so this, the, you know, I times our emission, that's just a, a unitary rotation that we're doing. Um, but we do that on, on each one of them and then take the, the product. Um, and this unitary rotation is not just the fixed uh, value, but we, we have to even integrate over, um, so we have a distribution over these, these uh, values of different unitaries that we have to go over. Okay, so this looks very complicated, um, um, but um, we'll see that it's it's kind of, exactly what we what we need. Um, so first, um, for those who, who know um, a little bit about these things, so the, the, the original proof for strong subadditivity um, was very non-trivial and it used uh, a result which is exactly of, of well, it wasn't presented in this form, but, it, but it, it turns out to be exactly this result, but for three matrices. Um, and it's a special case of this for, for three matrices. So this was used to, to show this strong subadditivity, which is equivalent to the, the data processing for the, the relative entropy. Um, and so this is an extension of, of that. Um, OK, and so this distribution here is just, well, it, it has a, a particular form that's not so important. It's peaked around 0. So at 0, we, we wouldn't do any unitary, and we would just have Gordon Thompson. Um, um, which we we know um, wouldn't hold, but if we integrate over all these different uh, different uh, rotations, then then we get something that that works. Um, 
And one thing to note is that the, the first and the last unitary rotation one can, one can remove. So on the A1 and the A4 uh, here, if I look at the example of four matrices, uh, there is no rotation. And this is simply because, um, uh, because the, these are unitary invariant norms. So, so they absorb the two of the unitaries. This is also why this gives exactly the Golden Thompson when, when we just look at two um, operators. Okay, so, so one of the tricky things uh, is really about these, uh, these rotations here. And um, so we did some, some numerics uh, to show that really there's not that much freedom in, in, in what this distribution here could be. Um, the, the problem is essentially that, uh, so, so here the blue line is the, the left hand side, the, the dashed line is the right hand side. So the right hand side is always larger than the, the left hand side, that's fine. But if you look at, at values, specific values of t, you find examples where, where at t equals zero that the equality is violated. But if you, if you go to, to uh, away from zero, it, it's, it's now satisfied. So, so you know you need to put some weight on, on these t values of t that are away from uh, zero. And then you find other examples where, where in fact, um, it's satisfied, uh, in the quality satisfied at t equals zero, but, but for, for large t's, it, it's not satisfied anymore. So, so you know that this distribution over t also has to be uh, focused enough so that you don't take into account uh, values too far away. Okay, so that's, that's kind of just explaining why, why we get this, this shape. I mean, we don't, uh, this would be one interesting open question to, to really show that uh, it's necessary to have exactly this, uh, distribution, but that uh, that seems to be difficult. Okay, um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to go through the proof at all, but I'm, I'm just saying it. it it's based uh, the, uh, the main ideas are from complex interpolation, um, it's a, a refinement of, of Hadamard's three-line theorem that's used as the kind of the stepping stone to to get where we want to go. Um, and uh, and yeah, you have seen the result that, that we can derive from this. So I want to quickly discuss the one um, application of this because it it's, it's brings us back to the topic of of entropies, relative entropies. So uh, what I mentioned before is that the, the Libruska proof of of uh, um, strong subjectivity used this this. Um, um, triple matrix inequality, which is a special case of what we have. And, and what we were able to do is to, to strengthen this um, uh, strong subjectivity using the four matrix inequality. Okay, and uh, let's maybe just take a quick uh, look at this. So, so there's a special case where the, the map um, that we are doing is a, a, a partial trace. So, so we want to Essentially, what we want to do is we have this, this inequality here. So if, if I remove this, this additional term, this inequality is just a data processing because um, removing the B system um, is, is one, one particular channel, maybe the partial trace that, that I can apply. And, and, and thus, the strong subjectivity uh, tells us that, OK, this, this inequality uh, holds. So what we want to do with the four matrix inequality is to, to find here a remainder term um, to strengthen this inequality. Okay, and so we first maybe look at this in the, in the case where all the, the, the operators commute. In that case, it, it's very simple to, to derive such a uh, bound. So this is the, the classical case. Um, so if we just plug in the definitions of all these, these operators and, and rewrite them a little bit, because we can take things into the same logarithm because everything commutes, um, we get an expression here that um, essentially looks like this. So, so we can see the difference between the, the relative entropies is uh, again a relative entropy between the state uh, that we started with, Roy B, and, and this thing is uh, what we call a recovery channel. So we, we 
we take the, the state of the output, this row A, and apply a, a specific map to it that will bring us hopefully close to the, to the state row B. Well, it turns out that if this difference here is small, then, then uh, we get very close to the, the original state using this map. Okay, and this map also has a property that it, it takes the sigma A to sigma AB. Uh, so so the, it recovers the second state perfectly. And the, the first one, uh, it tries to get as close as possible and how close it can get depends on, on kind of how much we lost in this data processing step. Okay, so this is quite an intuitive way of, of measuring um, how much uh, information gets lost in, in, in this operation. Um, good, so, so we want to do something similar in the quantum case, but, but uh, it turns out that it's very difficult. So if one just tries to, to uh, do the same, apply the same formula with, with this recovery map, um, then it just doesn't hold for general quantum states and, and there's also no inequality, it kind of can go both ways. Um, uh, sometimes the right hand side, sometimes the left hand side are, are larger. So, so that really doesn't seem to be any hope um, using exactly this formula. So, so uh, there was a lot of um, progress in the community over, over a couple of years to get from, from this conjecture to one that's actually correct. Um, and, and one can show this now with, with this, this four matrix inequality. So the difference here is that um, this relative entropy here has to be replaced by a measured relative entropy, uh, which we have seen is, is in general smaller than uh, the relative entropy, but in the classical case it would be the same. And this recovery map here has to be replaced by one that uh, contains this, this kind of unitary rotations uh, that we've seen in the, in the Gordon-Thompson inequality. Okay, um, so that's um, the result we get. So, so, so essentially telling us that we have a remainder term and it's meaningful uh, in the same way we kind of expect. So that this is a channel that tries to recover row A to row AB and, and how well it works depends on, on how much information we lost by, in this case, uh, removing the system B. Okay, and um, let me just quickly um, tell you one, one application of this, this, these bounds. Um, it's kind of a, a problem that appears in, in topological codes, for example, or, or, or generally in solid state um, physics problems, um, where, you know, you, you might have, a, um, let's say, a, spins arranged on a line or it, I mean it can be in any dimension but the, the point is that you have a setup <clears throat> where uh, this part b here is um, lost for some reason so so you have quantum information encoded in, in this this full system but the part b gets lost um, and the question is how well can you recover this b if you do an operation that only acts on the c part here uh, on, the, on these boundaries, but does not act on the A. So it leaves the A completely intact. And it's just a local operation here. Um, and the question is, can you recover the full state you had originally um, uh, after you lost uh, B? Okay, and, and what we can show is, is um, that yes, um, and, and this was first shown by Fauci and Renner, this, this band is a special case um, of our um, inequality, but it, it tells us, yes, uh, it is possible um, to bound the, the fidelity that you can achieve by just doing such a recovery um, in terms of what is called this, this conditional mutual information. And this conditional mutual information tells us um, essentially what are the correlations between A and B um, if you conditioned on this system C, so also kind of mitigated by this, this C. If these correlations are small, so if this is almost zero, then 
then we can achieve a high fidelity. And, and this gave a very important meaning to this conditional um, mutual information and, and, um, and they, this result was thus widely used in, to study such uh, problems in for topological code. Okay, so uh, the proof, again, um, I'm gonna skip this, but basically it, 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 it closes the circle because we're using this, uh, these formulas for the, these variational formulas for the relative entropy and the measured relative entropy um, and, and the Golden-Thompson inequality. Again, if you're interested in this, uh, probably the best thing to do is to, to read the paper. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you a lot uh, for, for uh, um, staying with me. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit and uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to answer your questions. Um, and uh, yes, um, there are PhD positions also available um, starting next year. So please contact me if you have anything. Well, thank you, Marco. Thanks. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was a very interesting, very comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, I think uh, uh, I learned a lot, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that some of our participants also. We have a number of questions here, and um, I cannot probably convey all of them, but uh, maybe I'll just ask you. Um, I'll try to. I was trying to reorder them so that you can get them in some sort of. Um, so you don't have to reply twice to the same kind of questions. But um, so here's one, a, a bit more technical, say. The question goes, what's the intuition between uh, classical relative entropy? Is it in any way related to statistical distance? Um, sorry, can you repeat again? I missed the, the first part. The... Yes, yeah, so the what is your intuition behind classical relative entropy? Is it related to statistical distance? Um, so I guess, you know, you were talking about that this is sort of a way of distinguishing the two probability distributions. So I guess perhaps that's, uh, that was probably. Something. Yes, I mean, it, it, yeah. um, I didn't get into this, but, but the, the, the relative entropy itself has operational meaning and it appears in, in, in hypothesis testing, um, the same as the statistical distance. So the statistical distance tells you, you know, what is the maximum uh, advantage you can have um, in distinguishing two uh, states or, or um, probability distributions using a, a single kind of um, measurement. And the relative entropy is, is something that appears in the same problem in, in an asymptotic setting. Um, but the setting itself is a little bit complicated. So I don't want to uh, maybe go into this too much, but it, right. it, yes, it, it, it is, uh, it has a statistical meaning in hypothesis testing. Right, so I, I guess we can leave it for, to, um, to the participant maybe to communicate with you directly. The another question is, when golden Thomson inequality was derived, any assumptions about dimension, is it valid for any Bach Banach space? So I I guess well, the question is whether uh, the golden Thomson inequality assumes uh, that the matrices are finite or not, of finite dimension. Um, or so, or there, are, there are certainly generalizations that, that work in any, without any assumptions. Um, the question is, may, does it make sense to write it up in the way I did um, in infinite dimensions? That might not necessarily be True, because you, you 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 want to write it in terms of all the bounded operators and so on, um, but but it has been generalized to to all um, settings, even for Neumann algebras and so on. Um, yes, thank you, Marco. So some of the questions are difficult for me to um, really um, decipher. There's some someone. Uh, Sangram is asking about reversibility in quantum computing and how come entropies pop up. Um, but it's probably a bit more general question, so maybe I'll just uh, skip it. Sangram, you can just communicate perhaps with uh, Marco directly on this. Um, 
So another relative que related question is, are classical cases always obtained by assuming that all quantum operators commute? Um, yeah, I mean, this is usually, you know, we want to define an extension of a classical concept. So, so this is maybe the one axiom that we, we put in that, that we want this to be true, right? Um, um, so if, if, and also for, for all the, the, the operational problems we define for quantum systems, um, you know, they, they, they also work for, for classical systems. So it's a, it's a special case. So, so we kind of, all the, the quantities with operational meaning would then also have to be uh, recovered, the, the classical ones. So operationally, this has to be the case. And, and so we take this as, a, as an axiom for the, when we define the quantum one. Okay, well, let me move to, um, I don't want to take too much time um, for this question, but let me move to some more um, general questions. So here's one. Your work seems to be very mathematical. Are engineers using such mathematics these days? Uh, are engineers using such mathematics? Um, yes. Well, there's actually... Yeah, there's a, there's a tradition of... of um, in engineering departments of having applied uh, mathematics people um, in there. So the information theory, um, surprisingly, historically has always been in, in, in electric engineering departments, for example. And, and also information theory is very closely related to statistics. And so th there's a tradition of having uh, applied maths in, in, um, in engineering department and, and luckily in, at NUS is actually very strong. Uh, so there are quite a few people in engineering that, that are uh, working in these areas. Essentially, right. we can see, so, uh, yeah, maybe just one more comment. Essentially, the, the idea for this is that, you know, if, you, if you're an engineer and you want to, for example, design a, a code for, it, for a channel, you, you really need to, to have these kind of analytical results that you can then just apply and, and, and use, um, for example, to do simple optimizations and so on. So, so it's very important for in practice to, to have um, an analytical understanding of these problems, not just, you know, not just doing numerics, because uh, the numerics, you, well, nowadays people are more focused on numerics and machine learning, but, but still there is a tradition of, of having people in engineering that, <clears throat> that uh, are able to make progress on, on theoretical questions. Indeed, I think that in Europe, there is a strong tradition. I remember some of the textbooks from Ecole Polytechnique written by Lawrence Schwartz, which were you know, designed for engineers in principle, but were extremely, um, use, use extremely sophisticated mathematics. Well, Marco, so the last but not least is a funny one, I think. It was, uh, the question goes, um, you mentioned a one bit per letter in English. How about Singlish? Are Singaporeans more predictable? <laughs> um, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, I, I mean, maybe somebody should study it. Um, it's okay, it's La, good, Marco. You don't have to answer this question in detail. No, I'm, I'm trying to think whether the the law and lay and so on they they um, they are pretty. I think they are predictable because when I would use them, I would use them wrongly always. So I think they they're actually predictable which one it is, and so maybe there is much less entropy in the language than I would know. So um, yeah. Um, so here's one. Yeah, so I thought it was the last question, but let me take one more because Charles Lim wrote, um, Hi, Arthur, a more relaxing question for Marco. Question, now that people have studied definitions of entropy for quantum systems, would there be value in generalizing some of these definitions ideas to general probabilistic theories? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there is some work in, in this direction. Um, this is a bit beyond my uh, direct area of interest. Um, in a way, that, that leaves the realm of engineering, uh, unless we find a, a physical theory that actually would, would use this. Um, 
I mean, generally, these this, this probabilistic theories have no, not really enough structure to, to, for us to say that much. Um, um, but in, I mean, in, in principle, it's an, an area that, uh, yes, still can be studied. So I, I'm probably not going to do it though. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's an it's a interesting challenge for those uh, who want to enter this field. Um, uh, you see the last slide. Uh, so Marco, um, uh, you know, is one of the authors of this wonderful book, Blockchain for Babies. And if you cannot read small print, I'm reading it for you instead of, I mean, maybe it's already too late, but... It's too late. Marco it's too says, late. <laughs> Oh, it's too late. So, guys, sorry. So, the hidden treasure, the first book, um, the, you know, the book on on blockchain for babies is already gone. Um, well, thanks, uh, Marco, for offering this. Anyway, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, and um, all of those those of you who would like to know more about Marco's uh, work, you can you can see uh, all the links on this page as well. And uh, PhD positions are available from. Uh, 2021 uh, and uh, so regardless difficult times do come and do work with Marco in Singapore you are for a wonderful mathematical slash engineering slash physics adventure right Marco thanks so much and thank you to all those of you who join us remotely from all over the world um, we will uh, this kind of concludes our our sessions of inaugural lectures but we may consider running a similar sort of a sequence of uh, accessible talks for general audience. So stay tuned and watch our website. Anyway, thanks Marco and thanks all of you for participating. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>